thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is Forever God is with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God we will carry on, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us.
Lord God, your love surrounds us. You're faithful. You're not just faithful now. You've not just been faithful in the past, but forever you are faithful. Forever you are strong. And so your love is the firm foundation that we can build our lives upon. And when we build our lives upon your love, that firm foundation, we begin to have our eyes opened to know, to grow in who you are and in who we are because of you and to follow your lead through good times and bad, through joy and sorrow, through the excitement and yet fear of what's to come. You lead us. And so we build our lives upon your love. And Lord, as we sing this song, and we've sung it a few weeks in a row now, and that's what we do when we want to learn something. And we want to learn to sing it well, yes, Lord, but we want to learn to mean what it says, to mean the lyrics, to mean the words. And so just show us who you are, even as we sing this song, as we sing the songs of old and the songs that are new. Help us to get closer and closer to you, our Lord, our Savior, our friend, our Father and Spirit, who leads us in Jesus' name. Amen. When I saw her the Prince of glory did hide. my riches gain I count but
playing far too small. Not so amazing, so divine. Demons, my soul. Let's pray, folks. Heavenly Father, we all come to you with our many burdens, burdens that we've started the year with, started the month with. But yet, Lord, we're just so appreciative that from our beds we wake, from our slumber, that we're able to breathe the moments we draw that first breath. Lord, we pray for the roof that shelters us, for the heat that's provided by our boilers and electric. We have the opportunity to eat and to share company, whether it's in person, with the person that sits beside us, or the person next door, or even over the phone through fellowship. To this we thank you, as we're well aware that so many suffer and may not benefit from the same luxuries as what we have. Lord, as we've reached January, hooray, after December of uncertainty, and last minute plans after the Christmas period. January tends to be a month of reflection and sometimes a little bit too much reflection at times. When the house is dark, once again, the holly jolly music and flashy lights have been packed away and our minds start to pine for better times. Thank you, Lord, that there is help out there, help through a friendly face at the door, through groups where all we need to do is ask. And living in the highlands, we give thanks that we have nature all around us, for the creepy crawlies, the birds, that start to sing at dawn and dusk now as the nights or the daylight hours start to draw ever so longer. We give thanks for the folk that have access to charities and the charities which have the ability to benefit from and help towards mental well-being like Clarity Walk, Birch Walk Highlands and Befrienders Highlands. We thank you, Lord, that the church is also a fantastic encouragement and enticement to meet up learn and comfort one another. Lord, we pray for those in our community at the barn, whether in Inverness or further afield, as now with technology enhancements, so many are able to watch the services and activities within the church, but as well as further afield. We pray for Mike, our minister, Laura and the children, for Izzy that's constantly on the ball, and for Becky running between two churches, which certainly can't be easy. Lord, we also pray for the amazing volunteers that keep our church moving, whether it's through maintenance, the sound desk, Sunday school, and so many others. Lord, we thank you for these folk, and we pray that you draw in those that may add and assist with their gifts to benefit our church as it grows. We pray for those that are suffering, for those that have both visible and hidden hurts, as we remember loved ones that are needing your healing hand and comfort. We remember those that are lifted up to you through the various 
prayer chains for those that are close to our hearts. Lord, as we take a moment to pray for them, hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for the change on COVID regulations that comes into effect as of tomorrow, for those that are maintaining the regulations and layouts of the rules, for tolerance and understanding as we continue to stay safe and protect our loved ones. We pray for all folk involved in fighting, supporting and recuperating Lord, as we enter into year three of this painful pandemic, we pray for third world countries and countries around the world, especially the likes of India, Nepal, and Brazil, who are experiencing peaks in cases with the prevalence and persistence of the Omicron variant. We grieve all those that have been killed by the virus, all who have lost loved ones, all who care for the sick. Over 5.5 million deaths have officially been reported worldwide, yet some estimates shows over 19 million. Public health officials tell us that the income inequality, which is now a stronger indicator as to whether people make it or not. Let us hold ourselves accountable by working for more accessibility to vaccines and adequate health care for all. Lord, we pray for Tonga and the people of Tonga, where homes and lives have been decimated by the recent tsunami wave triggered by a volcan volcanic eruption. The island remains largely cut off from the outside world because of electronic grids going down. Lord, you are everywhere and can be anywhere. May all those who are lonely and alone feel your solace of you, your everlasting mercy and abiding presence. May your presence be known to all who are weary and heavy laden. Lord, we pray for those in the Ukraine as troops from Russia approach their borders and anxiety of an impending attack arises. We pray for all those that, whose lives have been turned upside down by political and economic upheaval, especially Kazakhstan and Haiti. Protect all your children, Lord, as loom, uh, fear looms and dark uh, danger lurks. Shelter those whose lives are dedicated, dictated by war, tyranny, and greed. May the, those in spheres of influence not just make decisions for their own benefit. Turn their hearts, turn all our hearts towards serving and protecting those who are vulnerable. Lord, as we go into this week, we pray for the heartbroken sibling, the Jewish siblings after hostages were taken and th pray for those of other faiths, especially for the family of the, the folks in the recent attack in Texas. Lord, we pray that anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred are in, which are encountered in the world and within ourselves are strong, strongly looked at and re-evaluated. Lord, help us to draw strength from that which January might not have provided, but yet 
there to help us. Lord, thank you that you are there to help us as we fall. Pull us up from rock bottom so we can stand up tall and as a Christian, as a Christian walk with us in every step of the way. Lord, hear our name, even though we may be looking like Bambi, looking in front of a car, blinded by headlights, in your name, amen. Uh, growing young. Growing young sounds like a slogan for a cosmetics company. And cosmetics is a multi-billion do billion dollar industry, uh, and we are obsessed with staying young, and that's what that proves. Yet, in reality, there's not a thing that we can do about it. Even the youngest of us is growing old. Sorry, folks, now that I've reached middle age, that's the kind of well, optimism has gone to a bit of pessimism in that front. And the church is generally growing old too. In every denomination, in congregations of all shapes and sizes, in most countries of the world, the age profile of the church is getting higher and higher. And there's some great exceptions to that, but generally the rule is the church is getting on a bit. But just now, as I said at the beginning, along with Kings and Vernice across the road from us, there are a group of barn folk involved in now the second year of this growing young learning community, funded by Inverness Presbytery and the Goodness Project Funds. Most of the journey so far has been during the pandemic, and the effect of which has been the decimation of youth ministry, as reported by large city churches in the Central Belt just as much as anywhere else in the country, even the world. And ironically, during that time where technology provided a huge opening for digital connection for older people, it had the opposite effect uh, on tech-savvy youth. And I think that took us all by surprise. So even the relatively small numbers of young people regularly involved in church life before 2020 has been hit really hard. And it makes actually this journey more timely than ever before. And the purpose of this preaching series is not to show the church, is not to show the church that Growing Young is a cool program and strategy that God's going to use to transform youth ministry, because it is not. But the purpose of this preaching series is to share how the Growing Young research is shining a light on what God is already saying about church culture, which inspires and nurtures young people into deep faith. It's uh, provided, uh, hosted by the, the Fuller Youth Institute, which is part of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, where some of the great churchmen of our time, such as the Reverend Bart Buell, were taught. And they've conducted research among 250 churches across the USA of all shapes, sizes, denominations, and contexts. All of them had a healthy and increasing level of engagement and integration of young people aged 12 to 25. And the results are captured in the books, Growing Young and Growing With. I highly recommend them to you. They're very readable and, uh, and really ground what the research was about. And the development of learning cohorts has come from that. And ours is the first in Scotland, maybe even in the UK, with 20 churches, um, uh, in, including Church of Scotland, in, most, mostly Church of Scotland. King's is coming with us into it. But it includes churches like St. Andrew's Church in Arbroath and Bankery Westkirk who actually have reasonably good youth numbers already, but there's many others with effectively none and everything else in between. So it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a program for the struggling, as I say. The research showed that church tradition, worship style, and programs were not a significant factor in why these churches that were researched were growing young. And it did flag up those six core commitments that all 250 churches displayed in terms of engaging and retaining younger people. And these core commitments, not strategies, are the seeds of culture change within church families. So in the coming weeks, we're going to look at each of them and what God has to say about each of them. And they are, just very briefly, unlocking keychain leadership, empathize with today's young people, take Jesus' message seriously, fuel a warm community, prioritize young people and families everywhere, and be the best neighbors. Crucially, none of these core commitments mean a single thing out of context, and their context must be rooted in a Jesus-centered community in which these uh, core commitments can grow and flourish. About 40 of you completed a survey last year. Uh, I know it seems that Robin says as the time 
passes, it's, uh, it goes so quickly. It hardly seems a year ago, but and you, or on the, on the other hand, it may be like, what? Really? Did we do that? I can't remember. Um, but it produced a growing young church assessment report for us, which I'm going to share again by email as well as the book recommendations. But using a traffic light system, we had, uh, for the barn, we had a red light, a red flag against keychain leadership and empathy with today's young people. And we had an amber on prioritizing young people everywhere. The rest were green, which is good, but it isn't an indication of perfection. It just means these are not uh, big weaknesses for us or they're areas of more strength when it comes to connecting with younger folks. So with that bit of context in mind, Alison's going to uh, read three passages to us today, but we're going to pause after each to reflect on them uh, briefly. And the first one, the thought, is going to be grounded in vision. So Alison, please come up. First reading is Psalm 145, verses 3 to 12. Hear the word of God. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Amen. So vision. Vision. The word vision has become fairly commercialized in our culture today. It's a punchy slogan that's meant to uh, attract people to what a company or an organization is all about. And we may think it's a bit gimmicky, but God's word is very clear and serious about vision. Proverbs 29, 18, for example, says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision is about not our vision, not our ideas, but God's vision and revelation to his people through vision. A church's vision on a website might give newcomers a bit of insight or info about the family. But the primary purpose of vision is to guide those whose it is towards its realization. So it's a destination and a guide and a way marker. At the barn, we embarked on a vision development process, which was really substantial, evaluating and developing our vision. And it started in 2015, and it's in a way still ongoing, but the big work happened in 2015. And that included from reframing our vision statement to distilling what our core core values were, or rather how we'd communicate them, to restructuring, and that just happened last year, to finally restructuring our leadership model to facilitate that vision. Now we can put the Barnes, Barnes vision and values into two sentences. It was much more difficult in those early days how we would communicate it, but it's, be, it's naturally come to life in this distillation. Here's two sentences. We aim to live a worshipful life founded on a Jesus lifestyle built on rock-solid relationships. And this means developing a culture of experiencing God's presence, impacting the world around us by sharing and being the good news of Jesus Christ, and growing in relationship with him and each other in everything we do. That's our vision. That's our direction. That should be increasingly our experience as we live it out. Now, the portion of the psalm, is a long psalm, but the portion of the psalm that we just read never specifically was a guide for our vision development um, process that I can remember, but it, it is so similar. It's a vision casting psalm. It's a wisdom psalm. But what it's not is a description of present reality, Sam. You see, tracking the history of God's people, Israel, through the Old Testament and the church and the New Testament and its history ever since until now, there are very few points where we could read this and say, that's exactly how the worshiping community is. It is, however, 
painting a picture, casting a vision of what the worshiping community of God's people should look like and could look like. It, along with most church vision statements, if it was taken as a descriptor of what a church is like now, then we could all be prosecuted under the Trades Description Act. But it is, however, just as our vision is, aspirational. It's the kind of community that we want to be. And if we want to realize it, we have to do nothing else but to live into it with everything we've got. The Barnes vision and values seek to weave together three core aspects of who we are and what we, uh, what we do or what we want to do and who we want to be. Worshipful life. It's about looking up to God, seeking deeper relationship with God and experiencing his presence more or at least being aware of his presence more. Jesus' lifestyle, it's about looking out, modeling our living on Jesus, not his policies and just what he's about, but his mission that he gave us, serving community, living by example on our front lines and being the good news, rock-solid relationships, looking in, nurturing each other in the community of faith, teaching, praying, doing life together, building up and sharing faith together. And we want these values not to be departments or compartments of the church, but threads that are weaved through the whole of church life. It's not our present reality in full, but we are striving as well as aspiring towards it. Eddie may well put the the passage back on screen for us here and uh, on Zoom, because to call out verses that I'm referring to is going to be so difficult, because so, so well weaved within it, it's better just to have it there. It's hard to give you references, but... Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. These are all in the realms of God's people looking up and cultivating a worshipful life. Then they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. These are then all in the realm of God's people looking out, sharing Christ's mission in the world, proclaiming. His greatness no one can fathom, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Your faithful people extol you. These are all in the realms of God's people looking in, reflecting on who God is, sharing testimony, teaching one another, worshiping together, learning the family culture and ways of life. Yet in the context of being a church growing young, thank you, Izzy, we can put that off the screen now. In the context of a church growing young, what does our vision say specifically about young people, our barn vision? In actual fact, it says nothing. But that's not to say they're not included. It's not to say they're not part of that or intended, but they are not mentioned by name. And it strikes me that where there is no vision, we know the rest. But the heart of our vision, the heart of it is for all ages. And perhaps our focus needs to be more cross-generational or intergenerational rather than generalized. And maybe that's the next step of development. But the psalmist, on the other hand, is really clear about where this vision of the relationship and identity of the worshiping community relates to the young. Verse 4, one generation commends your works to another. That's not just a nod to the youth. Nor is it a blanket statement that at the end of a generational life cycle, the baton gets handed on. The life cycle of the church is not something that we go along, it's all ours, it's all ours, it's all ours, and then it gets handed on. Actually, that's probably how it tends to run, but it's not meant to be that way. It's continuous. We're supposed to integrate all ages and stages into family life. And it's not just the commending of God's works that gets passed on. For every they statement in the psalm that I read out in the different parts, that's part of that passing on. And here's something I want us to ponder deeply, actually, and we can take this away with us. Why do we assume that one generation to another implies older to younger 
or senior to junior in a linear form. Perhaps a psalmist has passing between or back and forth in mind. What did Jesus say about such things? Matthew 18, 3. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And just one chapter on, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's not just what the old have to offer the young, but the other way around and always around in between. So that's the vision. Alison, come and uh, read again, please, this time about the command. The second reading is Psalm 78, verses 1 to 8. My people hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide from them. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Amen. Thank you again, Alison, and you're welcome for helping me get your step count up today. (laughs) The command. The Psalms can often be very direct, pretty hard-hitting. And I must be honest with you, by this time in my life, I've come to value a straight shooter much more than my younger self would have done. Um, That doesn't mean I'm any more keen to be hit between the eyes, but I, I actually honestly believe it's good to know where you stand with people. And a distinctly Scots phrase that we could put into the psalmist's mouth from the parody of the First Minister's early COVID briefings, the psalmist is saying, you've been telt. In the Psalm 78, we are indeed telt, not just the vision and wisdom of passing on tenets of faith and sharing faith between generations and the wider community. We are reminded that it's nothing less than a command from God. Not only that, it's a command that previous generations have failed to adequately keep. And we can take at least two things from that. Given, uh, giving our all to turn the tide when it comes to young people's engagement and experience of the faith is not just a succession plan to keep the church moving and going and for its survival. But it's a command to be obeyed. It's not for us and it's not even for them, but it's for God. And the other thing is that we needn't hang our heads in shame and read ourselves as the failed ancestors. We're part of a very long struggle and we're in good company. For every generation represented in church today, there are some heartwarming stories of offspring developing faith and personal relationship with Jesus. And that is absolutely praiseworthy and awesome. But for each one of those, there are many more heartbreaking stories of children leaving church and faith behind despite the best and very similar efforts of faithful Christian parents. I was once one of those young people, and I also live in fear of becoming one of those parents as my younger generation grow. And the enemy loves to taunt us with that. Ah, you love Jesus, your love for Jesus is supposed to be infectious by the way you live, but you can't even convince your own house what a joke you are. That's a big fat lie and we don't need to be any partnership with that at all it's more accurate to say what a good deceiver the enemy is because deep down he knows he's ultimately lost but he'll try and take as many of God's children with him as possible and if he can convince us that we're failing that's a great uh, a great foothold for him but we are commanded not just within our own household but as a community of faith to do all in our power to fulfill God's will for young and old alike. And what is God's will? 
Jesus said, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So Psalm 78 is a call to wisdom. My people hear my teaching, listen to my words of my mouth. I will utter hidden things, things from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. And has a similar vision casting tone about it to the nature and culture of the faith community. But the psalmist goes further here. It's not just wisdom and good advice. He draws on the statute books too. Passing it on is a command. Verses 5 to 8. He decreed statutes for Jacob and he established the law in Israel which commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God and whose spirits were not faithful to him. I know, and I can join the chorus of experience, that it can be the case that we try our very best to engage our own and the community's young people with faith. But still it can seem like an impossible challenge. And with every passing generation, less seem to be engaging regularly with the life of the church. And that's a challenge, and we're going to come to look at that challenge in the light of our next and final reading. But whilst all God ever asks of us for anything is to do our best, at the same time, we can never give up. We can never say, well, we've tried everything and they're not coming. And we can never think it's impossible and just accept that we're a dying breed because it's a command. But the one who gives the command is faithful, slow to anger and rich in love. So we're not condemned for what we have not been able to achieve yet. And we're not alone. And we're not without hope of turning the picture around for all of our distanced generations, for all of those people that we love and who are not here all of the people who we want to love and we're not here so that leaves us with a challenge Alison last one the final reading today is Matthew 25 verses 34 to 40 then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Amen. The challenge. Vision, the command, the challenge. If we didn't feel challenged before, we certainly should now. Because not only have I drawn the attention to the possible gaps in our vision, I've raised the uncomfortable reality that a lack of any generation within a church family is at least in part our failure to live out a command of God. And then just to cheer us all up, uh, we've read about the final judgment, or at least the part of the sheep and the goats parable. Trust me, the intention is not to incite doom and gloom or condemnation or to suggest that the predicament of ours and the majority of churches is pushing us towards the goat side of the equation. That is not it. Turning the general picture of decline in the church around is a challenge which is way beyond us. And to be honest, one that in families and as a church we've been trying and praying into for years, even decades. We need God's help. And that's precisely why we take Growing Young Research and we hold it up to the light of the scriptures to see what he is doing, 
what he is saying. And if God wasn't at work, then its findings wouldn't have been found. But he is. And what the research does is identify strands of DNA that exist in some churches that usually not by strategy and and sharing more widely across the global church what it is that they are doing and being, how they are living, so that we may yet thrive in a multi-general church situation with a future of growing young ahead of us. But the real challenge is not about the generations who are not here yet or the generations who are no longer here among us. The challenge is about us and our own transformation. A couple of years ago, a a, a local church that was uh, looking for a minister came to speak to me to ask, not to ask me to apply, but to ask me as a minister, what might I look for in a parish profile when seeking a church? So from my one and only experience of that, uh, and of uh, reading many parish profiles on the way and speaking to nominating committees during the years of 2013 and 14, and from many colleagues' experiences too, here's what I said. I said, most profiles will say something about wanting to reach younger people and families. What a prospective minister wants to know is what they mean by that. Because it's often about hoping for a return to the church's past fortunes, where there was lots of young people and families around. Maybe the 1950s or not much after, or certainly before. They won't usually have accounted for doing anything substantially different to achieve that goal or how they might create the environment to sustain it. What they hope for is a return to how it used to be. But if how it used to be isn't being achieved by the way that we've always gone about it, and it's something one person can't change, that's the, that's the case. It's not, it's not going well. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not, a, it's not a criticism in that sense that uh, people are... <laughs> churches, do, we do expect the impossible. We expect things to happen, but we don't really think about how, how much do we have to change to happen. Well, we keep doing it. We're doing our best. We tell people. We tell the youth. We advertise this. We do that. We do whatever. But we have to be willing to think differently and do things differently, I believe. We're learning through the growing young cohort to expect the unexpected, not the same old, same old, and expect to see fruit in the unexpected places. One of the chief researchers who we've had direct access to because of the pandemic, all of the whole th- cohort has been on Zoom, uh, and Jake Mulder, who is, who is one, of the, one of the directors at Fuller Youth Institute, he shared this thought-provoking story of something that happened to him and his own family. It's a real story. They live in California, And one year, they wanted to grow a crop of pumpkins in their garden and make it an educational experience for the kids as well. So they set about the careful planting of seeds in small pots that would later go into the ground. And the workbench was their picnic table in the garden. And they emphasized to the kids the importance of getting the right amount of seeds bedded into these little pots in the right way with the right soil. And then later on, the next stage was to plant them into the main growing area across the garden. And then they put up the appropriate fences to keep the particular Californian-style wildlife away from them while they grew. And for weeks and weeks, they monitored and cared for the crop as it began to spring shoots and grow. All of this demonstrating to the children that if you follow the well-known steps, good stuff's going to happen. But one day... They were horrified to discover that a large animal had broken their fences and destroyed the entire crop. Parents and children were disappointed. So disappointed. A few weeks later, they were having lunch at their picnic bench when one of the kids stubbed their toe on something hard underneath. And to their amazement, as they looked under the bench, they discovered a pumpkin or two growing strong and healthy without having been planted on purpose and without having been protected. They simply got scattered accidentally because of childlike humanity losing some of the seeds. They found themselves settling in fertile soil and they just grew. Jake suggests that we do the same with strategy for engaging youth and look for a similar outcome as well. Doing the same things and expecting different results, it's often been described as the definition of insanity. But perhaps we should look for growth in the unexpected places. That doesn't help us with knowing how to face the challenge 
of engaging with all generations today, especially the younger ones. But in light of the passage and the reality of what young people are saying about faith in another piece of recent research, the lives of the sheep in the parable should give us, I believe, real hope and encouragement. Now, Des Johnston, who you may know, uh, the pastor who's uh, director of Alpha Scotland and also the chaplain general to the Boys Brigade, shared with a group of local um, church leaders in December about some research being conducted just now amongst 50,000 under 25s. Now, in the UK specifically, 43% identified as Christian. But only 12% said they had a personal relationship with Jesus. So that's both an encouraging and very worrying statistic for me in equal measure. Because nearly half identify as Christian, but there's a huge gap in understanding and living of having a personal relationship with Jesus. 46% said they owned a Bible and 14% said they read it regularly. That's a similar big gap, but I would let them off with that because I'm not convinced the over 25s would fare much better. But here is the part that got my attention and it took me back to Matthew 25. The top five global concerns of people under 25 in order are extreme poverty, climate change, sexual abuse, unemployment, and political corruption. In other words, justice and mercy. That's what they cared about most. Those identifying as Christian and those not, justice and mercy. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And Jesus said of the righteous who did these things without a thought of gaining a reward, come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Now, of course, the picture Jesus describes has in view the final judgment, or rather than the final judgment, the commissioning service for the new heaven and new earth upon his return. We don't know the day or hour that will come, but we do know it's coming. And the Lord expects those who call in his name to be about his, father business, his father's business every day from now until then. And that business is seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God, as Micah put it so succinctly. So two things stand out for me when putting all this research side by side with the scriptures. There's a population of young people out there who are not closed to faith by any means and have in their heart the same priorities that Jesus calls us to live by. So praise God for that. Because, praise God because it's happening and because it means also there is real hope of reconnecting and making new connections with missing generations. That hope is not lost of doing that. It's very much alive. In fact, it prevent, it pre, not prevents, it presents so many wonderful opportunities for the church to engage, albeit looking in the places we may not expect growth to be happening. However, the gap between having a heart for what Jesus has and having a heart for and recognizing the importance of having a relationship with him. You know, the 43% that say they're Christians, but only 12 say they're for Christ. It's terrifying and challenging because as comfortable as it may be to acknowledge, that's the difference between being good people and what Jesus calls the righteous. Doing good stuff or supporting the right causes doesn't make us righteous. Righteousness is only found in personal saving relationship with Jesus. So when we come to understand who he is, accept and trust him, trust in his death and resurrection and his why that it was for us and to reconcile us to God. The gap in understanding has arisen between that 43 and the 12, has arisen, I believe, because those young people have not connected with or stayed connected to a worshiping community. And that's our challenge. That's our challenge. And it's why it's worth spending a few weeks wrestling this out further as a church family, families together. 
and investing a lot of time and energy beyond that to create a culture and environment that embodies at least the six, at least the six core commitments that Growing Young identified with a vision that future research will find that the same 43% of under 25s now have a personal relationship with Jesus. And because of that, it's no longer 43%, but 80 or 100%. What difference will that make for the church? Heck, what difference will that make for the nation and for the world? But do you know what? It won't be just the young who are blessed when that becomes a reality, when that vision is realized. All generations will be blessed because the church will be more whole as it was meant to be. It will flow with wisdom and energy, enthusiasm and experience. All of these things that it needs to thrive. Joel 2, 28 to 29, I will pour out my spirit on all people in those days. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I say, yes, Lord, let's see that. Let's do it now. And as we wait, let's not relent from having a bold vision. And let's be mindful that reaching generations is not optional, but it's a command. And let's be encouraged that God is already working in the hearts and the minds of those that we're missing within the community. He goes before us, and the victory is his. So never mind our anti-aging creams and our just-for-men die. Let's age well by growing young God's way. Amen. And let's uh, pray together as Sunday Club. Join us. So we just pray, Father, that you would reveal to us insight and wisdom, um, solutions and strategies and all of these kind of things. But Lord, prepare our hearts. We talk about preparing an environment where a culture um, develops that will nurture and support people of all ages and stages. Uh, we pray that you would start in our hearts with that. Make that the fertile ground where things that we maybe didn't expect to grow will grow and pop up like those pumpkins because actually you, we can put up our fences, we can develop our strategies and put everything in the right order and get our ducks in a row, but Lord, it's you who sees and protects and plants and nurtures and grows. And what you want to see come to fruition does, not because of any success of ours, but because yours is the victory. And so we give you thanks and we put ourselves on your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love. my days all of my days i will sing the to Lord's you and worship the mighty god heart is worthy god in the new land you are the great and i will bow down before the lamb you are the living god And I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love you. I will love you. All of my days. All of my days. You I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love and adore him. And I will bow down.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.